I've been asked countless times, or t said by people, actors, saying, I don't want to be an actor, I just want to do voiceover. Uh -oh. And every time I hear that, I'm like, that, no. Uh -oh. No. Yeah, you uh -oh. have to know how to act. That's the, the, the number one thing, acting. Thank you. Thank you so much for all being here. Very excited to have our panel today of illustrious animation casting directors. I think one of the great things about a panel like this is to get to know the face and the person behind the breakdown, behind the auditions. Um, so I'm just gonna start us off with a basic question. Just, why casting? <laughs> How did you, you can just a brief, you know, why did you get into casting and then maybe a little bit of, um, do we have to? It, oh, no, it's on. Yeah. A little bit of um, uh, animation. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah, everybody test. Make sure Sibylin, you're Sibylin. Do you want me to Are we first? ready? Okay. Yeah. I, I feel like, like maybe, we're, maybe we oh, need to do me. a quick slate. Okay. Hi. Um, Wait, I gotta to get ready. Hi. But, um, <laughs> my name is Jackie Salito. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's really awkward. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, I went to Chapman University. And I did the Dodge College there, which was really fun. And while I was there, I thank you, you know, oh, Chapman. <laughs> um, and I did an internship at ER on like their 13th season with John Levy. And it was amazing. And I was like, oh, yeah, this. This is the part I care about. I was doing directing, and I was like, yeah, directing's cool. And I'm like, I only really care about working with the actors and getting that performance. And I'm like, Th that's a thing? You can just do that? So I did that. I met, I had the opportunity to meet Nancy Foy, who is a treasure. A treasure. It's the perfect word for it. Oh, you're good? Oh, I was like, ah. And uh, that, I was like, oh, I want to be you, because she's amazing. And so she mentored me, which was fabulous, and it was one of those things where it was my last week of school, and I had an interview on a Wednesday, uh, or Tuesday or Wednesday, I came all the way up to LA, had my interview, and then Friday I got a call, they said, hey, can you, can you start on Monday? And I was like, oh yeah, I'm uh, graduating tomorrow, so I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> And I uh, didn't look back, so here I am. So, Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Sarah? Uh, so, well, I studied uh, theater at UC Irvine. Zot, zot. Uh, I came to LA to be an actor for five minutes. <laughs> Until I realized like, oh, I loved rehearsing with my actor friends more than I liked acting. So I loved that process of it. And I was like, oh, I got to get on the other side. So I worked at Cheesecake Factory because that's what you do. Uh, no, and then I got some on-set jobs that, um, at television and I thought that was really interesting. And then I ended up sort of falling into this job at Nickelodeon. And it really, they, at that time, I just sort of did everything and I started casting the promos. So I really started specifically in voiceover, and I hired all my friends. I was like, I have some funny friends. Uh, and uh, it was a wonderful experience to start that and then really grow into that position, and then that I moved, and then now I'm at WBA. So I've sort of just done it for many, many years. Many, That's a shortened many. version, because- I love it. My God, I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> uh, I'm Ruth Lambert. I uh, was a stage manager in college. That was what my degree was in, yeah. And, um, but a director from New York came to work on a show with us, and he one day said, Ruth, my friend Gretchen Rennell is casting The Winds of War. That's how old I am. And um, she wants unknown actors, so she's going to be in Chicago. She's going to fly to Milwaukee, which no one did, and you're going to set everything up. And so I picked her up at the airport, and I set up auditions with all of our actors, and then a couple callbacks, and then I took her bowling, because that's what you do with all the actors, and then I took her on a brewery tour, because it was Milwaukee, <laughs> and she had never been to Milwaukee, I don't think she's ever been back, and, um, and then she left, and then I graduated, and I lived in Virginia for a while and worked there, and then I was working in 
Springfield, Massachusetts. Don't clap. None of you are from there. It's a horrible place. Um, and David, the director, called me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I am so unhappy. I hate this. I hate stage managing. I hate waking up people who are older than me because they got too drunk the night before to come to rehearsal. Like, I didn't like that. That was, I was 23. That was gross. And so he said, because Gretchen got promoted and Bonnie got promoted and she asked about you. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, get on a train and come to the city. I'd been living in the city on and off, but then I was in Springfield. And she hired me right away, and she and Bonnie taught me a lot. We were very busy. And then I came out here and just worked and didn't work and worked and didn't work. And then, and then I was at Disney for seven years at Feature Animation. I worked with Mary. And then, um, yeah, I just, I, sometimes I work and sometimes I don't. It's great. We we're not all, all that different, are we? <laughs> so there you go. Awesome. That's a tough deck to follow. <laughs> I'm so old. <laughs> um, uh, I started, I had many jobs, and then I took a job at Disney Studios in the 80s. I answered phones, and then I worked my way up, and then this wonderful, kind, generous person hired me and gave me a lot in, of leeway to do a job that I never done before. It was awesome. And you were amazing and it, we had a great time and that yeah. was the beginning of my career because you are who you are. Uh, I'm Chandra Austin. I went to Loyola Marymount and studied uh, communication studies. I was very hard pressed on being like a crisis management PR person for some reason, uh, and so that's what I started doing. And then I lost my job and really wanted to get into uh, casting, and I, I met that wonderful human over there who gave me my first job in Nickelodeon. And honestly, that, your generosity and your like amazing mentorship helped me learn everything I know about casting, and she really let me fly free, and so I was there for almost 11 years, um, and then I, now I'm at Netflix. Yeah. All right, Julie. Okay, so <laughs> I cannot believe I'm gonna admit this in front of a group of strangers, but I was a dance major at Arizona State University. <laughs> and I got kicked out. <laughs> Hand to God. Hence my career in casting. No, I, I just decided to move to LA because I always wanted to be in entertainment in some capacity. I didn't even know what a casting director was. No, Did you guys? No. Yeah, right? And I had the incredible opportunity of working with Caro Jones, who was doing all John Avelson's films, the Karate Kid and the Rocky movies. And yes, that's how old I am. And uh, then I got a job with Mike Fenton. And that changed my whole life with Mike and Judy Taylor. Um, and I uh, worked for them for about eight years. Then I went to Saban and worked on Power Rangers. And, you know, and then, and then, and then started my own company, like these beautiful people, too. So, um, and none of them have given me a job, by the way, and I'm living. <laughs> I'll be over here trying to get one. Your like. job, I wouldn't have. <laughs> anyway, that's it. You can tell it's a small community in casting, <laughs> and we do animation rely upon, casting yes, for sure. Very yeah. small, and we rely upon one another for a lot of opportunities. I love hearing about the kind of tree, family tree of casting, because um, I know how I trace back my own path of casting, and it's always fun to hear how other people came to have the opportunities that they have now and took advantage of them. And it's so so cool to hear about all the women empowering each other and supporting yes. each other. So. Yes. Yeah. Casting, casting is mostly women. We yeah, make up a is. high percentage of casting uh, in this job, which is wonderful. Uh, well, real quickly, I started at 20th Century Fox in the feature casting office working as an assistant to Christian Kaplan. Um, I thought that Casting wasn't for me. I went and worked in development, ran a record label, and then in between putting on our artist, I was like, no, casting I think might be for me, <laughs> and took a number of jobs. Um, and when working with Francine Maisler, I was like, I want to be this person. And so I started my own company. 
she inspired me tremendously. Um, but yeah, that's my brief, quick, uh, my first animated film I ever got to work on was Ice Age. Oh, nice. Yeah, so as an assistant, yeah, it was really fun to see the auditioning process of that. Um, I'd love to, before we dive into some things, since we have a lot of actors, I do want to talk about the special things of animation, <laughs> auditions and whatnot, but before we do that, just because we've had some questions specifically to certain projects that the, each of you work on. Um, so we'll touch on that first and then we'll dive into auditioning and whatnot. Um, Julie, we're gonna go back. Um, <laughs> what, uh, do you find any differences or what might be some of the differences in casting a musical animation like Central Park versus Big Mouth or Bob's Burgers? Is there anything that goes into casting that that's different? Well, I mean, in, with the situation with Central Park, obviously we had Lauren Bouchard and Josh Gad, you know, who are like super into the theater community and into musicals. And so we just sort of relied on, you know, offering it to our friends and they all said yes, you know, it really was so much fun. Um, you know, a lot of my shows like Bob's and like Big Mouth even have become much more musical over the years, over the seasons that I've been cast. Yeah, we become much, much more musical. So, I mean, I would say <laughs> there's a lot of actors that I think probably would not want to sing. <laughs> and um, maybe have, I don't think anybody ever passes on these shows because I'm just so lucky to have, you know, these amazing shows that I work on. So I don't think anybody's ever passed, but probably there's been some people that weren't as comfortable as singing, uh, but we made it work somehow, you know? Uh, it's comedy, right? So you don't have to be the best singer on the planet. It or maybe you can like Bob awesome. Dylan it where you kind of like exactly sort of yeah. kind of <laughs> speak kind of it sing, yeah. speak yeah, sing. Yeah. but anyway uh, so I, I don't ever recall us you know sending out a breakdown or anything saying we have to have singers or people who are great at singing even though we've had some of the most amazing Broadway yeah. musical artists in the world on our shows so I just think it's just more about just finding somebody who's funny and gets the comedy and knows how to have fun with it and not be self-conscious about whether or not they can really sing I <laughs> love it. Um, all right, moving down the line. Chandra, um, how are you, now that you're at Netflix, what, what are the differences between being in casting freelance and now being an executive at Netflix? Oh, I actually, I guess I've always been on the executive side, even at, at Nickelodeon, um, even though the structure of the department was a little bit different. Yeah. But I would say the support um, on the freelance side to me feels like you're very much running against the clock and the production schedule and really trying to hit in the deadlines. On the executive side, I feel like your responsibility is to really appease both sides of uh, the creative partnership. So it's the, the creative leadership, the EPs, and then also your content colleagues who are, <laughs> who are you know, uh, signing all the checks, but um, I think the, on the executive side, it is a balance of making sure that everyone's getting what they want out of the cast um, and really making that the priority. Yeah. And is your department really hands-on with the casting? Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nice yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think at Netflix it's interesting because I cover preschool through adults, so it's a little bit of everything, and each of our shows have a different um, production model. So there are some shows where we're very much, like we're the casting directors ourselves, um, but for the majority of our projects we're hiring external casting directors, so it's a little bit of both. Awesome. All right, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> You have worked with some pretty big animation production companies. It's pretty big powerhouses, we'll say, of animation. What's, this is kind of a big question, I guess, but what's the collaboration with someone when they're going to be making, at that level, what's the collaboration process with them? And is it more about casting celebrities? I mean, most of them are very packed with celebrities, but is there a focus on that? <laughs> yes, there is a focus on that. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, it's getting less and less the place that we go to because those people have all done yeah. animated movies or, or, and they don't want to do TV. Yeah. 
because we don't pay anybody in TV. <laughs> um, and uh, so with features, you know, it, it is collaborative in a way. Um, you know, sometimes I, we are tasked with, ha you know, a high-powered director trying to persuade them. You know, the company says, we don't want that actor. Could you talk to them <laughs> and maybe persuade them to go a different direction? So that's, you know, that's as collaborative as we get in the, at that level. Yeah. Because like working for somebody like Guillermo del Toro, who just, you know, I just want, he just wants whoever he wants. Right. You know, and so that's what we do. But then there's other characters that he doesn't know. He doesn't know who they are. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know what the actor acting pool is. So we just, you know, that's our job right. to bring, you know, bring him like really valid choices. Um, so yeah, it is, you know, it depends on who it is, you know. And when you start a movie, like, the Lego movie, is it the is the question or is the conversation ever we're going to make a few of these? No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, with that, yes, the, on that, I I signed up for three movies, I think. Um, but that was it was that was a whole uh, that's unusual for right. them to say that, you know, because they don't know and you know in, until yeah. it's successful, the studio's not going to make another one if it's not right. So I don't know if they ever hedge their bets. Like we're pretty sure Lego movie is going to be a big movie. <laughs> Let's do Lego Batman or whatever. <laughs> no, but but they didn't even like they didn't even have that. Like yeah. it was just like we're gonna do another we're Lego do movie. More. We just don't know what it is. Like, you know, Batman tended you know was just the you know breakout character in that because Will yeah. Arnett. You know, wow. um, yeah. So, but they also didn't do holding deals for actors no. in that movie because that was like, are you are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. Now you're gonna pay Chris Pratt a billion dollars. Right. Well, they did pay them. They gave. They, <laughs> they gave them. Yes, they gave them. They gave them. They gave them. box office. Which yes. Was unusual. That was the other thing. That I was, was like, screw I said to uh, Dan Fury, you what? That was a mess. Worldwide box office. Yeah, Nobody yeah, does yeah. that. Nobody does that. Stupid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We can only do so much in well, our job as casting it's directors. Them. It, it, it's not them. Yeah, it's not them. And foreign talent like does all the voices for yeah. animated movies, so we don't even use dope. them. Yeah, yeah they're so dope. they got so worldwide. Gonna, so they got worldwide, which is yeah. insane. No one does that. Not, no no one, does one does that. Does that. Dan Fury said, "I'm ashamed." Dan Fury said, "I'm ashamed." Thank you. And I was like, "Good." <laughs> <laughs> Very good information for us to keep in mind for our future deals. Don't ask for worldwide, you won't get it. Yes. Might as well ask, right? They can only say no. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Ruth, you, uh, everyone here has worked on a number of amazing things. You have really covered broad base of genres. Um, and so is there a difference in casting a big Disney movie and doing Rick and Morty? Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest, I mean, when I started at Disney, I had never done voiceover. It's the first time in my whole career that I got a job because of someone wanting me. Tom Schumacher brought me in. Um, I had to learn a lot very quickly but it wasn't hard, it was sort of fun. And I will say, I mean, doing musicals, having people sing at you. Yeah, ugh. the best. You just really fall fun. in love with everybody. It's just like, oh my God, I'm in love with so many gay men in New York. <laughs> I mean, right? It's just like, please sing that to me again. Please sing me that love song again. Thank you. Um, I love doing musicals, it was great. I had never done voiceover before. I had never done a musical before. I had never done any of that. So I had to learn very quickly. And it was fun. And they gave me a lot of room and a lot of space. And they had just started using stars for things. Like Lion King was stacked. Yeah. And you know the movies before that had one or two people, Robin Williams or whatever, but they weren't stacked. And so that started a whole trend, but they wanted me to audition everybody. We auditioned everybody for almost everything. It was great. Like, it was great. You know, you'd look up and Madeline Kahn would be reading with you. Bugs oh, Life. We had the best. Bugs Life. Bugs Life. Oh, oh my God. God. It was the best. Those sessions were the best. And Tarzan, you know, Ian McKellen. I read with Ian McKellen. I mean, come on. But they tortured Ed Harris, remember? They tortured a lot of people. Um... <laughs> But so, to go from that to Rick and Morty, 
Which I didn't go right from that to Rick and oh, Morty. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I took two very different parts of two your career. Two very different parts of my career. Together. But Rick and Morty, it's just sort of like, well, who do you think is good for this? And then we'll make a list, and some people will audition, or... I was watching Seth Meyers one night, and he had Paul Giamatti on, and he said, would your, do your teenage sons watch anything you're in? He said the only thing they would watch would be Rick and Morty. And so I was like, let's hire Paul Giamatti. <laughs> and the agent was like, he'll never do it. And I said, he will. He will do it. He said he would. And he did it. And so, you know, if you find someone with a 16-year-old son, they'll do it. It's very different. It's much quicker. It's... But then we have like 18 month hiatuses because they're very slow to write. I don't know, they're all very different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has been kind of schizophrenic. Like, what am I doing now? What, what are we working on now? Who just got fired from what? <laughs> and I've done live action too, and that's a completely different, uh, very wonderful world, I think. We kind of miss doing live action. But um, no, they're all very different, they're fun. You just have to sort of readjust every time. Mm -hmm. right. That's all. Right. A little recalibration. A little. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, Sarah. Uh, you oversee a lot of projects at once, it seems. According to your yes. bio, 40 plus. Ruth wants me to hire her because we have so much stuff going on. So I'd like to. Why should we I know. Why not yeah. throw her hat on? Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, She's me too. right here. She's right. throwing her hat in the she, ring. She cast Harley Quinn, guys. It's an amazing show. Wow, nice yes, I, I got to credit Robert, too. Robert. Robert's great, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that many projects, or what are some ways you use to kind of keep track and then are there any special um, considerations when it comes to working with a known IP like Batman or something where it's, it's already has existed in many iterations? Are there any special ways of handling the casting of something like that? Yes. I mean, our DC characters are always, we have to ask the questions like, can I do this with this character? Like, is it open ethnicity? Like, the, immediately. Uh, and I think that's sort of the nice advantage of working at a studio, Warner Brothers Animation Studio, is I have these creative executives that I partner with. So I get this information early on um, and able to sort of ask those questions early on. Like, what are we thinking? Is it, is it namey talent? Is it not? Like, where, what direction? So I think that helps me with sort of getting a lead on it. And then, then that producer comes in and, and that's, and like Ruth said, it's so fun. I, I just enjoy it so much. I did live action casting too. Yeah. There's something about animation that there's a playfulness and an openness that I get a wider range of talent that I just love. Um, and I think it's just so much, it's broader in a way to cast that. And I just, I love that part of it. Um, and, I do think, and I love the variety, like coming to Warner Brothers, I used to do Nickelodeon, and it was all kids and family, and you know, and I'm like, okay, I've done that for a really long time. So it was so fun to do a show that had swearing. I was like, oh my God, I'm so not used to this. It is fun. Shit. Like, great. So um, that was just a really fresh new take, and I, I just love the variety, and I still do preschool stuff, real kids casting, as well as all the way doing adults you know, animation casting. Um, and it's really, it's been great to do that, so. Dirty animation. Dirty right. animation. I mean, I do have a really funny story of where I, um, I pitched somebody, and I can't remember, it was like, um, it was a football player or something, and I said, hey, do you want to do this adult animation so show? And the response was like, well, I don't do porn. <laughs> and I went, oh my God. Not that kind of I don't either. <laughs> what a relief. Yeah, yeah. You're like, good. <laughs> God that is hilarious. I do think one of the kind of there's a, <laughs> one of the freedoms with animation is that someone can look like something, but with voice they could play almost anything. You have the freedom to cast people to play things they wouldn't necessarily be a slam dunk for or normally get to do. And that's something very cool about, even when you're watching something, sometimes I'm like, wait, who is that? And then you look them up and like, wow, I wouldn't have pictured him having that voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we cast um, Joaquin Phoenix as a bear in Brother Bear because he wanted to play a bear. <laughs> that's all he wanted was to play a bear. <laughs> 
He made his dreams come true. It's such a terrible movie. <laughs> Heart. Not because of Joaquin, we love him. It's unwatchable. <laughs> well, trust me, I've tried. They're not all good. Can't all be winners. They're not all good. It's a collaborative process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we all go to see things and go, that's what we did? Yeah. Um, well, it happens. It happens. It's happened to me plenty of times. That's not what I pictured when we started the process, but there it is. Or it is, and that's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You thought it'd get better later, and you're like, oh, it didn't. No, no. <laughs> okay. You gotta watch the whole thing. No, Mom, you can't watch anything I work on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, last but not least, Jackie down there. Um, so, uh, you work on Family Guy, um, but the show's been on forever. Right, like I think yeah, I was in it has. college. Yeah, it has been on forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you, what was the process on coming onto a show that has been on for a bit, mm. or where did you come in? I guess on the process. I don't know exactly Four when you started. Four score. <laughs> yeah. And Seventy-five thousand seasons ago. <laughs> um, just as a disclaimer, obviously, all of my opinions are my own. They have nothing to do with any of the shows that I work on. Of course. Just a heads up. You're only speaking Just for Jackie. Just speaking for me. Um, no, we were very, uh, very lucky to come on in and, and work with, honestly, the teams on Family Guy and American Dad are phenomenal. Like, it's, without sounding completely cheesy, it is a family there. And that made uh, the transition a delight, which often is not the case and I'm sure you've all experienced yeah, that. Yeah, we came into the Cleveland show. That was not a delight. No, and I've heard, yeah. So it's, so we were very, we were like, oh, this is, and they were very kind and understanding because um, you know, my business partner, Christine Terry and I came in and we both had been doing live action for many, many years and so we're like, be gentle, <laughs> you know. But it was a, a lovely learning process, and the even the studio and the network. Everybody, like honestly, I was like, this is great. Like this is great. Um, but coming in with something that's been established for so long and has had so many talented people on it over the years uh, creates its own, you know, challenges in that sense. But in the same way that the ladies were saying, you know, people that you wouldn't expect to want to do things. We, we have been getting a lot of folks who are like, no, my kid loves that show. I would totally do that. And also folks that you wouldn't necessarily think of approaching. And for example, uh, we were working on American Dad and um, looking for a very specific thing. And we thought, we're like, what about, what about Chris Pine? What's he doing right now? Nothing. <laughs> right? I mean, nothing. All, He's nothing. just waiting He's like never call. busy. So we called his team, we're like, look, I know this might be like, but he hadn't done the shows. And so we're like, well, let's try, you know, and he's funny. So this would be great. And we got the best call back. They're like, he is so excited to do this. He could not believe that you were calling for him to do it. And I was like, excuse me? Like, okay. We had one of the most amazing recording sessions with him. He came in, he was like, this is so funny. I'm having so much fun. I just want to do a character. You guys are the best. We're like, you're the best. Like, this is great. You know, it was, it was just a really lovely collaborative experience. And by the way, amazingly talented in voiceover, has like all these different voices, has amazing timing. You know, it was such a cool experience to see that with somebody that you're like, you know, very familiar with in one sphere and one setting. And so having the chance to do that on shows that have been so established, but still having the ability to find people who haven't had that chance yet or, you know, and then also like, let's be honest, take it a chance and it doesn't always work out. <laughs> sometimes you gotta recast because <laughs> it didn't work you know but also and introducing them to folks that you're like wait they haven't done this show yet like how is that po they're like so established in the you know voiceover field or they've been doing it for decades and years and they just haven't been on the show and and then getting the chance to bring them in and getting you know getting to introduce our teams to new voices and new people and one of the things that is extremely important to us in the work that we do is diversity um, and not only, and as you were saying, because as voice work, it doesn't matter. It's the best talent, but also utilizing that diversity to make it 
not only visual, which it can be, um, but just to give opportunity wherever we can find it. And so we've really pushed that since we've joined the shows and um, and it's been very successful and we're very happy with that. And it's been a lot of fun too, because it's also exposing teams to, you know, folks they might not have really looked at in the past, you know, and not on purpose, but just because, you know, we're doing our own job and our research and finding new folks and, you know, looking for where we can find people in different places and, and getting auditions and listening to a thousand auditions, you know, to find somebody new because we want to show them somebody new that they haven't heard before. So that's been a challenge, but it's also been really fun. And that's my favorite part is finding somebody who that you were like, oh, I had no idea that that's an amazing sound. And that's that person? No way. That's great. You know, and not having to be hung up with the this. face. <laughs> not that this isn't great, but, you know, not having that restriction is is phenomenal because it just really gives you so much freedom in the creative process and to bring so many new things, you know, to the table, yeah. which is a lot of fun. Well, and a lot of, some people have incredible vocal abilities that you don't necessarily know. And then you hear them do 15 different voices, one to the next, and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe it's the same guy doing all these voices. Like D. Bradley Baker, who is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, that's an appropriate response to his name, is the kind of person where, within the first week that I was there, they were like, we're writing this bit, and I think it might have two whales arguing. <laughs> and we're like, okay. Um, who do you think can do that? And D happened to be going in to record for American Dad for something else, and we're like, hey, do you have a minute? <laughs> what are your thoughts on two whales arguing? What do you think that would sound like? And he, I kid you not, two whales arguing. And I'm like, that's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, but that's what it was, you know? And it was, it, it's, it's talent like that where you're like, I don't know what two whales arguing sounds like, but it sounds like that. And he just can do that and you know, even people like you know Alex Borstein how many more voices can Alex Borstein have I don't know but it's endless. phenomenal it's endless, endless. and just ugh, we're very we're very lucky with our series regulars they're fabulous well speaking of auditions when and anyone feel free uh, to answer but when you know submissions let's let's think in terms of not our famous friends um, but we're gonna we need some roles we don't know this group we put out a breakdown for the for the voices what do submissions look like for animation and MP3s. what they don't look like anything <laughs> three play, MP3 so three files hear them. <coughs> right so the headshot no we don't care don't not care. important no. don't send us headshots what well, we would work be at home great. now too, so please don't send us yeah, that. That would be really <laughs> weird. But what would be in this package? So if I'm going to send in my wonderful vocal reel, um, what what would be best in this package? Reels are hard. You mean like a, just a reel? Yeah. If I'm going to, I say not a proper not like an audition. actual audition. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, sending in a submission. Reels you are don't hard. Know me. Reels are real hard because you can't. You don't hear what you need to hear. Like you need to hear a certain thing and you get a reel and you hear 20 things and none of them are what you need to hear. So it's not a real, I mean, always, never make you go, ooh, I'm sorry. They just, they just don't because you're listening to so much, so, 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 so much. And a reel is just 20 more things and none of them are what you need. So I would right. always and rather not get a reel from anyone. I agree. And the sh I agree too. And then the shows are also incredibly different. You will have a tone of a show is super cartoony or another show will be incredibly grounded. We try to do our best to make sure that when you're reading, like you kind of understand that yeah. tone because if you're doing a wackadoodle character and it's a very grounded show, you're like, yeah. oh no. So I think that's what we try to help to give that information so that the tone and the style of that show is described to give you the best shot at that character. Otherwise you don't get the job. Yeah, yeah and also it's not, it's, it's okay to do like more than one audition, one more yeah. one take, yeah. but less than five. Oh, yeah. don't do more yeah, than, less than three. Five. I, I like a yeah. three. Okay. Don't do more than three. Yeah, don't, don't do, do more, more than, than three. three. Because then that I gives us three, yeah. yeah. And options. never do line by line. No. Because the people we send those auditions to can't listen to that. Yeah, I'm nice know what it, and I edit put them. It together. I edit we them. We don't do that. I don't have time. I'm That's a really nice person. You are. Also, you'd be surprised, like Rick and Morty, 
Dan only wants to hear real. Really? <laughs> On a show where there's so much shrieking. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, well, that's too cartoony for Rick and Morty. <sighs> <laughs> Okay, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. And so that's what we send him. We won't send him things because he won't hire someone who sounds cartoony for a show like that. So, you know, but reels, like I remember when I first started at Disney, a dentist sent me his reel and he was, someone told him at a party he was good at voices. And so he did a bunch of voices and then he sang Beauty and the Beast and it was like... (laughs) Thank you so much. I can't use this. And then I put it in the garbage. Sorry. I mean, just to, but that's what happens. You can't but you listen keep. to it. I did nice. listen to it. But I didn't listen to him a, a lot after that because I knew, you know, when it, you get reels and it's like ca- selling cars, I don't, I don't need to no, hear that's that you like can a sell a car. Reel. I yeah. mean, I think, you get Ru- sometimes. Ruth, your point is uh, voiceover acting is acting. Yeah. And that there's a sometimes people go, "Oh my god, I have a friend who has such a nutty voice." And I'm like, "Are they an actor?" Because it's still acting. And it always will be. So I think that's where sometimes I think people get misled and and it has to It's a voice. scene, it's a beats, it's knowing that character and I love auditions where I'll sometimes get a, a random person who Sometimes we don't give you the most information, and that's usually because the maybe that producer at the time hasn't figured that character out. And I love pe- when people make choices, and then I'm like, oh my god, that just made me perk up. What did they like? I'm buying that, and that is an interesting choice. And then even if it's off character, because it was sort of surprising and different and unique, and they that person brought their take to it, I always select them, and yeah, yeah. they often get chosen because they're bringing their 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 thing to it they're like oh i i get that character and then it i don't know i always have that you know when you have that you listen and listen Uh and you went oh that oh and you get excited they're completely wrong but they're not completely wrong right right (laughs) and we have the power of getting that so much power this is complete this is not what you wrote but listen to this this is cool Yeah. yeah i would just add to that because i think I have cast based off reels just in terms of some timelines that are just very, very quick. So I would say to your point, if you do have a reel, show your acting range versus your vocal range because then we can see that the acting's there. We're not listening to maybe a voice that you can't necessarily sustain that's out of your like technique or, you know, your um, your vocal part. Because you could do a voice that may hurt you eventually if you get hired on it. Yeah, I've, I've been asked countless times or t- said by people, actors, saying, I don't want to be an actor, I just want to do voiceover. And every time I hear that, I'm like, that, no. Uh-oh. No. Yeah, you uh-oh. have to know how to act. That's the, the, the number one thing, acting. I just want to add, though, for the auditions, that making the your own choice thing, is it's so great when that happens because it is that aha moment when you chance. However if there is a lot of specific notes, please take the notes. Well, yeah, that's the clue that that (laughs) that producer or that they they know what they want and they're very specific. If if it's very little description, you have room to play. That's usually how it goes. Like we're recasting Rick and Morty (laughs) for all sorts of horrible reasons that I want, you can Google it, do your own homework. About to say spoiler but the alert. auditions <laughs> that we have gotten, oh my God, like five, six, seven hundred auditions we've listened to. And it's a lot of, I finally called Robert and I said, I have to stop, my ears are bleeding. But also what it was, was clearly someone at a party drunk, their friend said to them, you do a great Rick and Morty audition, you should audition for that. And then they sent it and there, there's no acting the voice is bad, and so you need a good actor for those parts. And so, not everyone can do it. It's not a, it's not um, a party game. It's a skill, and it's a job, and you have to have that skill to get the job, I think. One of the questions that came from our wonderful audience, um, I think, is appropriate here in terms of do you think that voice training yeah. is beneficial in working in animation or working in voice? I used to. 
I don't know if I think that anymore. I used to when I worked at Disney because they wanted trained actors, they wanted trained voices, they wanted a certain um, quality of actor, but the stuff I work on now, I don't think that that really makes that big a difference. Anyone else? Thoughts? We've had a lot of um, success with folks with like Broadway and theater training yeah, yeah, yeah. because they have the ability to utilize their voice as an instrument um, without having to really fully rely on their bodies and they can push it and folks who haven't had theater training we've found that you know when you're used to doing you know television or film it's all like right here right um, but we don't give it about that in the vocal booth so we need to hear you need to have that emotion in the voice and so Improv, stand up. Improv, you know, very important. Improv, Everyone wants sick the improv. Disney Channel. Yeah, I mean, but having that ability to, you know, ideally, you know, get big, but then have the ability to bring it down because there's going to be some range. I mean, you know, with kids' shows, it's different. They need more energy. The kids need to pay attention, you know, and then there's with dramas that we've done, you know, like you were saying, it's got to be grounded or something. So it's, but without the ability to, do that variation and also to bring emotion through just voice it falls flat and it's yeah, painful it has to be connected <laughs> yeah i've always said like if um because sometimes i work with kids and if they sort of goosed it i called it schmacting <laughs> because it's not connected it's not grounded and so i do think yes and sketch comedy also is helpful yeah, and character you know and sustaining a character and stuff like that so yeah i would add to yeah. that yeah, I've done a number of things where we need people who are being chased by monsters and doing heavy action. And I feel like people who have worked with their voice some are more capable of doing that when they're standing in a booth and nothing else is, nothing yeah, else yeah, is yeah. happening. Yeah. And using your imagination, it requires just so much more imagination, I think. They didn't have an actual monster in the booth with them? Not yet. <laughs> What kind of show Those are it? called efforts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Those are called efforts. Effort, yeah. um, my husband's done a little ADR looping. That's, yeah, that's his best thing. Efforts, getting punched and yeah. Yeah. playing monsters. That's his best thing. Um, just for some basics, a um, few things have come up. Not doing line by line, and a couple of things. If just for those who maybe have very little experience with doing a voice audition, can we walk them through just a little bit? Like in this, uh, like do they just slate their name? Do you ever ask for additional information? Um, and what would that mean? Like, do you, you want the full, with the scene and not repeating themselves in the middle of the scene, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, slate, do the scene, maybe do it again. Depending. Send it. But no more than three times. Send. <laughs> Because you know what, you know we don't we don't know. Like nobody yeah, knows what know. you know. So and you're you, you know just because you didn't get the job doesn't mean you didn't do a god good audition. No, you know. And so it's just you know it's just numbers and you know just listen you know just do it. I think what we mean by don't repeat a line if you haven't done it is that when you get hired, they have you run the scene, and then they have you go back and hit each line three times, usually three times with a little different intention each time, but you don't want to hear an audition like that. I don't care, I can hear that and it doesn't throw me, but I work with people who cannot hear that. Like they don't, it, they don't understand it, they're new to animation. I work with a lot of people who are new and it's a lot of explaining. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and I'm not gonna cut that together. I know, you're not gonna edit you're it, that's not. ridiculous. <laughs> I think I'm nice. Well, <laughs> I'm going to send it to you, and you and can then I'll edit it. it. We just don't want to do it, so we'll just call and say, "Could you have them do it again?" and just run it. If we like the person, if we like the what we're hearing, and we think it might be appropriate, we'll call or we'll call and say, "You know what? That was a good audition, but let's make it better." So we'll give because we give such little direction up front, and so sometimes people don't know what we want. It's just right. what's on the page. Well, and that's part of your job. You know what I mean? Because yeah. we, you know, we're allowing you to bring what you think the role is. If we only give you like the age and right. so, and that's part of your job is to give us something that we that might be the character. You know, as an actor. But it's unfair. No, ma, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's unfair because in a live action audition, you come in, you're with us in the room. I don't know about now. 
um, not pandemic yet. time, not yet, but soon, right? Fran wants Let's that, hope. right? Anyway, so that's cool. And you know what? Being in the room, I think, is important in live action because it gives people a chance to fall in love with you. And that's, in live action, that's very, very important. It's a little less important in voiceover, the falling in love with who the person is. We just need to hear the right voice. You know, and I think it's different. Don't you, do you, well, do you disagree? I mean, uh, no, I you do want to love Actually, people, I just recently I worked on a project that I'm probably not allowed to name name. Nope. But I did, um, I did actually end up handpicking and bringing in people to read with me. Mm -hmm. um, and that, just seeing the actors, it, it helped them so much because I'm like, great, let's play this. Just on Zoom. Back and forth, I would give, I, oh, let's change this, pace this up, mm -hmm. all this. And then they get this instant feedback, and then I edit it. <laughs> um, <laughs> She's a saint. You're so good. You're so nice. Um, but it's been, it was really helpful, and it was, it's, it's been, it was just such a wonderful experience for the actor, and, and it also helped me sort of figure, because yeah. I was sort of like, we got to figure these characters out. Right. Like, this is a, so it was a, we can't do that on every project, right. because we just can't. The timing and the pace, but on certain ones, that, it can be pretty magical. We've done yeah, that on know. a few pilots, yeah, so that's helpful. It yeah. works in Zoom, and you can fall in love. I did. Yeah, even on Zoom it works. We've done like yeah. producer sessions yeah. Yeah. on Zoom and it has worked because that can that just having that I mean you know that just that moment of having just the smallest chat with someone that's not having to do with the character like where are you from? What do you do? I like your house. What's that in the, what's that artwork? You know just which is even more personal than yeah. coming into You're an audition their room. room. You're seeing their life a little bit. Your kitchen is great. I like the tile. That's but that's a dis that's like a moment of connection and it's nice. Yeah. But uh, we do that very rarely yeah. because it's just there's no time. Yeah. That's usually callbacks too, right? Callbacks, yeah. yeah. That's callbacks. And do you? Does anyone here maybe just go down the line um, when you're getting auditions for scene work, voice scene work? Do you appreciate when they read with someone else, or do you want them to be reading by themselves with nothing else happening? I like that when they, sorry. I like it when they have somebody to play off of, mm -hmm. for sure. I like by themselves. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because too. then I can actually hear the voice. Because yeah. um, I also edit. So I will cut it You're together. So good. <laughs> You're Studio so good. people. I will caveat. I like when somebody else reads with them if they're not <laughs> distracting. Yeah. Because that yeah. can sometimes be distracting. And a lot in sometimes they're better. Well, in the UK, I have hired in from UK, the I've reader. been working a lot there. There's a lot of time. They will always have a reader, and a lot of times the, the reader's fantastic. Better. Um, <laughs> I know, no, that has happened where I'm like, who was that reading? Yes. Who was that reading? But I, again, it's yeah. It's We've had a lot of problem with people reading with someone. Yeah, Actually, sometimes they're distractingly it, yeah. awful. Yeah. Oh, it's a few of the pilots or some of the podcasts that we've done. It's so bad that you can't even hear the other person, and it's I can't send it yeah. to my team because it's yeah. just you can't hear and the is actor. It, you can and edit it. Is a person <laughs> go edit it? I'm not Sarah. I don't have time for that. Is the is the bad reader? themselves I mean well or is well, it we usually an do, actual other person it's like another person or they're like on a phone and they're over here and yeah. they're on the and it's like a weird sound and because a lot of the times when we're doing stuff you know I mean not everybody obviously but people have an ear you know if they're doing animation and, and they hear it and they're like get a no you know so yes. we usually have to go back and be like I need done to do it again. We never send auditions you know. to yeah. our folks yeah. where they're reading with someone. When I worked at yeah. Disney, we would hire a reader because yeah. I would read with people, which I really liked, but sometimes it was just too long a day, mm -hmm. and I would do a week in New York or whatever, and it was just like, I can't keep reading with people. So I hired like Jack Gilpin would come and read, yeah. and I didn't know that was Betty's father, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> now we know. He was great though, so we would hire a good reader to read with actors, and it would, and I'm not an actor, so it would bring their performance up too. But you can always ask what the yeah. office prefers. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, uh, yeah, I do think that when listening to vocal auditions, every sound 
does make a difference. Like I can forgive so many things when I'm watching an on camera, you know, theatrical auditions. Like the dog walks in, fine. There's the Roomba moving around. Okay, got it. But when you're, when suddenly there's some sharp sound or a slurping or like clearly things. I don't want to hear your air conditioner. Like I can't. Yeah, like, no. Turn it off, please. There's stuff hap- that all of those sounds are so magnified when listening to just sound that th- that is extra distracting. Versus Please don't be driving in your car when you audition. Oh, gosh. It's happened, and it's scary. <laughs> At least pull over. No. Someone could die. Yeah, and might not even be you. No. Yeah, yeah, don't die. Yeah, please no, don't. don't. Be a horrible way to end that Pull over, tape. park, and then do the audition. <laughs> or just go home. Um, do does anybody have a favorite? I mean, you must mention a great Chris Pine story. Um, but are there any other kind of favorite? It doesn't have to be a famous person either. But a favorite casting moment or uh, an audition, or you just had this br- brave idea and convinced the team that this was the one. Any cool, fun story? Mm. I mean, I'm really, really, again, I'm so lucky to work with these amazing producers that Nick Kroll, for example, can make a phone call to just about anybody and they'll do our show. And we had this one role and, you know, we're just like throwing around names and ideas. And somebody said, you know, and from the list that we had made, what about Helen Mirren? Like, do you think Helen Mirren would do Big Mouth? You know, and we were all like, and it was a filthy role too, by the way, you know? And we're like, let's try it, you know? And we got Helen Mirren, Helen frickin' Mirren, you know? So that kind of stuff is so exciting for, or, you know, I mean, just to, just to get these people to commit to doing these, you know, Kristen Wiig playing a vagina, and, you know, just, they're so fearless. Her dream job, okay? That was her dream job. Yeah, yeah, she was pretty incredible on it. So, so for me, it's just just so much fun. Uh, there's so many people that want, you know, to, to be in animation and to, to bring whatever weirdness that they have to these crazy characters that are written, and it just delights me all the time. You never know who you're going to get, like you were saying, you know, yeah. Jackie. Um, it's lovely to be surprised. I worked on a movie called Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Great movie. Which is a great movie, my, my favorite movie. Um, and we had hired uh, two actors to play the leads. We had to fire them because the head of the studio didn't think they were the, the right the right voice vocally for the character. So we were looking for the main character, Flint Lockwood, forever and ever and ever. I happened to be at a party one night. Bill Hader was there before he was Bill Hader. I mean, he was on Saturday Night Live. But I was just standing and I heard this voice and I was like, what is that? And I go, that's Flint Lockwood right there. And so I talked to him for a little bit and then I told the guys, Phil and Chris, I go, let's see what, and so we gave him the role. He came in, he was shocked that it was the lead of the movie because he thought it was just some like tiny part. And then, but the struggle was for Bill Hader, because we wanted him to be himself, to be kind of be Bill Hader, because he's a big nerd, he's got a nerdy voice. Our character is a big nerd with a nerdy voice. He struggled so hard to play himself, because that's a hard thing to do for people like him, and for a lot of actors, I think. You know, because who are you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we finally beat it out of him and he's great so, so did he have yeah. a crisis in the booth he was like oh my god who am I yeah well a lot of people act to be something different yeah. to not be yourself yeah. right to get to play all the things that are inside the things you see the things we wished we had an opportunity to do I think that's a big reason it is but also like um, I worked on this show called The Life and Times of Tim, and now we work on this show, 10-Year-Old Tom, and it's all improv. Like, the scripts are very good and very precise, but Steve only wants people who can improv, and we would hire people that we thought would be able to do it, like Rachel Dratch, and she could not, like, it made her, and she's done, you know, she's from Groundlings, she, she could not get comfortable with it. We did not keep her. I mean, and it was just like, what? It's okay, she's on one of my shows now. She's, yeah, she is. No, I heard she's her in Spider-Man, Spider-Man, she's in Spider-Man, and she's great. Rachel Dratch is great. We've hired her a lot, but not for shows that are 
99% improv. And that's kind of weird mm -hmm. because you, they'd be like, well, what about so-and-so who's in Groundlings? And it's like, wow, we do not have a great track record with improv -ing. Not acting, improv -ing. And Steve just wants everyone to be in a room and improv. So that's why Jennifer Coolidge is so good on that show because that's what she's best at. And John Malkovich is on our show and he's really good at improv and Steve sort of provokes him and gets more out of him. <laughs> In the best way that a director and the, uh, the, other, the lead does. But I mean, it's kind of surprising who can't do what you think they can do. And then on the other hand, it's lovely to find someone that you didn't think could do it and they can. So that's sort of the fun of Dan it. Dan Stevens. Dan Stevens. Oh. He's the best. <laughs> don't tell anyone. He's the don't best. tell Julie Ashton. <laughs> <laughs> He's the you best. can't have him. You can't have him. I have Smile. had him <laughs> <laughs> multiple times. Dan gets hey around. I really hope Dan sees this. <laughs> He's in Ireland. I'm a stalker. <laughs> He's in Ireland. Right. How do you, just going back to that briefly, with the improv, so some of the, are there any people that you bring in for that situation where you're gonna audition them? Yeah, we audition, Steve wants auditions from everyone for all the roles. Um, ten year old, uh, Life and Times of Tim, Nick Kroll was in that. You know, I mean, he just came in and started talking. I mean, that's a long time ago. Um, and so, <clears throat> people audition. John Malkovich didn't audition, but everyone else auditioned for that show. And it's hard for me because I am not great at improv, so Robert ends up reading with people because I get very uncomfortable because it just goes on and on and and <laughs> just so long. And then, <laughs> like, I think I was reading with Nick Kroll, though, for uh, uh, Life and Times of Tim, and he was so mean. And I was just like... I finally just said, why are you being so mean to me? And it had nothing to do with the scene. It made me very uncomfortable. So Robert is really good at improv. So good that they gave him, he's in a scene in 10 year old, in Life and Times of Tim with Will Forte and Jennifer Coolidge. And by the end they're singing, I don't know when the saints go marching in or something. <laughs> and I don't, my partner is very um, calm and unflappable, and there he was, and just made me laugh so hard with these two, with like genius voiceover people and um, improvers. I just can't do it, so I know my strengths, and that's not one of them, and either is editing, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, uh, I don't edit much either. When I worked Yay. at Fox, it was a lot of editing. Yeah, a lot of editing. Very big, uh, oh yes, editing, yeah. man! You, I learned how to work a VHS machine like yeah. nobody's business. Because also for voice, then we would sometimes make voice reels for people because they yeah. didn't really have them. So you'd be watching movies and like that sounds like a good moment of that, and you put it together. Well, we used to have so a boombox. Right? Yes. We used to have a boombox. We have to watch TV, and you record off of the television. Oh my God! It was it so was primitive. torture <laughs> at Disney because we had no equipment. We had no equipment. There was no equipment then. There was none. We what we barely year had computers. Was this? <laughs> it was nineteen ninety five. Well, in the eighties. Well, it was nineteen ninety five when we were at Disney. Right, right. But we didn't have any ancient times. Yeah. But I mean, technology. We barely had computers at that point. Yeah. <laughs> they had just given us computers. They were Macs. I mean, we just didn't. We didn't have. But look how much you accomplished with a boom box and yeah. a, right? Can you believe we used to work like that? Well, I also had a whole wall of um, audio tapes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like with those sort of things pulled off. So when someone would say for the 800th time, what about Donald Sutherland for this? <laughs> Here, take a listen. And they'd be like, no. And be like, yeah, I know, no. That's why I kept it. <laughs> That's because Donald Sutherland was very, like, for voiceover, right? Like, yes. everyone wanted him, but it was never... He has done voiceover, though, and it's been good, yeah. but it was never Orange right juice. for Disney. What? Orange Juice. Orange Juice. Lots but he's done, an, he's done an animated show yeah. or something, but that was not... Not a Disney sound at all. But in their heads, that was a Disney sound, and so you'd make them listen. So 
Well, that's one of the amazing things yeah. with voice <laughs> casting, I think, is that, you know, I have people will say, like, here are my ideas. I'm like, do you know what they really sound like? Are you familiar with the sound of their voice? You know how pretty they are. Yeah. They, exactly. They know what they look like. And then you go, let's listen to them and put together something and say, here's some stuff to listen to. And people go, oh, that's not right at all. But sometimes it doesn't ma- matter. No, to sometimes them. it doesn't. Like for The Incredibles. Yeah. Um, they wanted, for the initial Mr. Incredible, they wanted Mr. Harrison Ford. And if you listen to his voice, it's so dull. And it just is not that character. It's not that character. But it didn't matter There's because he was that bravado. No, but he was just because he was Han Solo. And that's all that mattered. Yeah, we were so lucky. He said no. <laughs> <laughs> the as greatest to George, pass. As to, and their second choice after that, George Clooney, equally dull. Yes. Yeah. Like who? What? He what? did audition for Hunchback of Notre Dame, though. George Clooney oh. did. Very dull. <laughs> but like really sweet. But like a he nice walks man. in the room and let's face it. He was in the room yes. and it was like, that was fine. <laughs> that was a nice. He was really nice. Really, really nice. But it was like, you know, some people, that microphone makes them go dead. Yeah. yeah. Like it scares them. Or when, or when the people, you know, we'd have a lot of people in the room. Alan Menken would be in the room yeah. and Stephen Schwartz. Yeah. And people would turn around and they'd be staring at someone's back and you would see their knees start to shake. And it was just like, just look at me. I'm reading with you. Don't pay attention to the other people in the room. Because it, it is very uncomfortable if you're not used to it and if you're used to people looking right at you and engaging in you. And so to have five people turn around yeah. or look down and not look at you, um, really freaked some people out. It was interesting who had freaked out. Like, good actors who just, it, it was too much for them. It was interesting. Stars get nervous, too. Yes. And there is people. something with voice work. They're not, I mean, we are listening to the voice alone. And so you're not necessarily looking at people in the same way, for sure. There's a different kind of connection, which is why imagination is everything, I think. Yeah, and you want someone to come in and have life. Yeah. You know, because... You're looking at a picture, maybe, of the, a drawing of the character, but that's not moving, and so you need to hear some life when you are looking at that picture. And that's are they important. often reading alone, right? Well, I would always yeah. read. Uh, well, well, like, but uh, recording alone, I mean, yeah. so yes. that they're not recording, recording alone. opposite another actor. But we get and, readers you know, to read with them, them, which yeah. is great. Yeah, we have a lot of folks who are like, "Can we record like the whole?" cast together and the whole scene that's and what like, we do for no. uh, Life and yeah. Times of Tim and well, that's, that's what we do for 10 year old Tom can. but COVID has thankfully it's, made yeah. that very difficult <laughs> yes. because you can't put six people in a room oh, yeah. it's very so legally anymore and that's awesome because then you can't I mean I, you know but you can't it was so hard to get 10 people so when they're shooting all over the world and they don't live here and it was just like ugh very difficult yeah so well as we are reaching the end of our wonderful chat um just real quick does anyone here have a little piece of inspiration for those who might be here that are wishing they too were in animation or looking to work in animation any little inspiration or advice just a quick something I think it's just touching upon what you all were saying is that we can cast anybody in animation, you know? The world is your oyster out there. So just, again, have a really good, I think, voice demo where you show as much range as you possibly can. Work on that as hard as you can. You know, ask people for copies of their demos, you know, who people are who are successful in the voiceover world. It kind of blows my mind when you get like a Dave Herman's voiceover demo or something. Yeah. And you're just like, what? How, how did a thousand voices Kevin come Michael out? Richardson. Exactly. Oh, KMR. KMR as we call it. But, but I yeah, him. so I just think really and truly because of the, the fact that we are animation, you have so much more opportunity in the voiceover world than I think you do on, on camera, don't you girls? Yeah. Pregnant? We don't care. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You broke your leg? I don't care. Yeah. It's fine. Or even COVID. We had even people, COVID. I don't, I don't care. care. Do you have a setup at home? We worked alone. We recorded from yeah. home. You know? Get in a yeah. closet yeah. and record it. Get over it. Yeah. <laughs> Non-exclusive, right, <laughs> guys? Right. Non-exclusive. We don't care. Right. You can work on other shows and work yeah, on animation. Yeah, we don't care. Beautiful, Do it. Right? <laughs> oh, you're starring in six shows? We don't care. We don't care. We'll hire you. Yeah. Give me 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. We'll get you in and out. It's just, I would say, though, 
don't do funny voices. No. Don't, because maybe they're not as funny as you think they are. <laughs> Be an actor, act it. We don't really want to hear silly Saturday morning voices because you know what? The people who do those voices are friggin' geniuses. Mm, yeah. And maybe you're as good as Cat Cressida, but you probably aren't. So don't try to do that. We don't need you to do that. We want to hear what you bring to something, but we don't want to hear like crazy imitations of SpongeBob, because Tom Kenny, you're not going to beat him. Yeah. You are not. Mm -mm. So just be who you are and bring what, you're, what you think your strength is to it, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Speaking from some shows that do a lot of um, impersonations, yeah. we have a lot of that. Um, if you have a special skill that you would like to develop, uh, do that. But make sure it actually sounds like them. <laughs> not like a drunken Rick and Morty like at a, a frat party. Not like a drunken Rick and Morty. You know, and... <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, it's it's like exhausting, but <laughs> you know, but it is very helpful. For that, so. yeah. Ruth, you know, let's not totally knock it out. Yeah. There's no need for it, yeah. I promise you. But there are like specialty voices yeah. that can be very helpful, you know. And I mean, depending on the show and the style and the things. Um, besides being a very you know working actor and, and working on your craft, think about tone. Um, I think that's the thing that we run into a lot of, I don't know if, you know, I'm sure you all ladies yeah. do that as well, um, but often we'll get something that the tone is just completely off for whatever the show is. And I mean, if the show's already established, like, check yeah, the do internet. Do your research. You know. <laughs> Turn on the There's TV. no excuse anymore at this point. Yeah, you, know, you have do, it all at your no fingertips. There's no excuse. You know. Everything is on, you can Google everything. Yeah. Everything's on YouTube. If you're auditioning for one of Jackie's shows, there are 10,000 episodes. You know what the tone of those shows room. are. You know, it, it, for all of us, I mean, you can, it's very easy. So really do your homework. There's no excuse for not knowing. I agree. And I, I know we're talking about animation, but I think don't be afraid to try other uh, styles of voiceover because that'll help you inform your acting in animation. So try commercial, try podcasting, try narration, try video, video games. Games. games, video games, because it is, they're all very different. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll help you determine the tone for the animated piece of whatever. Yeah, and doing. I feel like there's a lot of animation out there. I mean, it's, it used to be a very tiny pool with a very tiny amount of actors, and everybody's like, I can't get in because Jeff Bennett's doing every role, Tom <laughs> Kenny's doing Kevin every Michael role, Richardson Kevin Michael right, Richardson's yeah. doing every role. And now there's a big expansion, and there's, there's more grounded shows. Like So there's a big array of animation that I feel that is happening and it's 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 opening up those doors to have more talent come in to fill these roles. Yeah, there's so much. It's not COVID. just comedy. COVID too yeah. made animation go crazy because we could work. It's very hot yeah. right now. Actors could work, we could work. Yep. There were no restrictions on us, so <laughs> it went nuts during right. COVID, yeah. like nuts. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot. Pick what you like. Don't be afraid to try. No, don't be afraid to try. We're here to make your dreams come yeah. true. You heard it here first. <laughs> well, yes. here's, but here's what you need to remember because sometimes I have to explain this to agents and to actors. We just want to hire someone. We don't want to dick around. We want to hire someone and move on to the next thing. We want you to get the job. We're not trying to not hire any of you. We want someone to fill the role so we can go on to the next thing that we're doing because we're in a hurry. We're so on your side. We're, we're on your side. We just want to hire someone. Please let us hire you. <laughs> so, right? <laughs> we are in we a hurry. We don't want to spend two years on, on a role. Uh, no. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> it's the Please worst. Well, yes. Don't make us work that hard. No, we don't want to. We're it starts older. to get boring after a while. We're living at we're working at home. We can take naps. Don't make <laughs> us work. <laughs> well, thank you all for an awesome panel. This was, How cool are these ladies? This was like one of the most so entertaining cool. panels I've 
been on, let alone watched. Um, but um, thank you all so much. And if you'll just give us a few minutes, we're going to get the panelists off. So stay in your seats. Um, thank you so much for being here. We're very grateful. Thank you, guys. Also, um, casting directors, there are 82% women. We're 82% women. That's a fact. That's 82? a fact, yeah. Ooh. And so, um, you know, here we are. It's cool. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs>